These animations are super popular, especially on stock footage websites. So we're going to learn how to create this particular effect. I hadn't been creating this for a while because I didn't know how to get something to move from the right to the left and still have it loop after that. However, I now realized how we can do that. And if you want to learn how to do that, you could check out my previous video, which is going to be linked on the top right corner right now. However, we're going to be doing it once again in today's video. So let's go ahead and figure out how you can create this looping animation. In our default scene, we're going to be using geometry nodes. So we'll bring our cursor to the junction of these two windows, click and drag to create a new window, and then change this from the 3D viewport to the geometry node editor. Then we'll press this plus button to create a new geometry node tree, after which we can zoom in, select the group input, and tap X to delete the default cube. Now let's press Shift A and search for a curved line. Of course, you could use a mesh line as well. It does not make too much of a difference, but for the time being, I'll use a curved line. I want this to be on the Y axis, just like that. So I'll make this a value of maybe minus two on the Y axis here and a value of two on the Y axis here. And I'll change this Z value back to zero. Now I have a line over here and I want to create a number of points on this line. For that, I can just resample the curve. So let's search for a resample curve node, plug that in right over here and change the count to maybe something like 40. Now that we have that many points here, we can instance on these points some more curves which are going to turn into the waves of our animation. So let's instance on these points. For that, we have to press Shift A and search for an instance on points node and plug that in right after the resample curve. For the instance, we're going to use another curve line and this time the curve line is going to go on the X direction. So we're going to start it at maybe a value of minus 10 on the X and end it at a value of plus 10. Let's remove this Z and plug this curve into the instance right over there. Now you can see we have a really nice set of lines that are going along the X axis exactly as we want. Now these lines have to be deformed. To deform these lines, we first need to give it a lot more geometry. To create geometry, let's press Shift A and search for another resample curve node and plug that in right over here. Now I want each of these to be very, very smooth. So I'm going to increase this count to maybe something like 400, but while recording, I'll keep it at maybe 150 and I'll increase it just before rendering. Next, I'm going to actually have to realize the instances because right now, remember each line is an instance and you don't have control over the individual 150 points that we just created. To get control, let's search for a realize instances node, plug that in right here. And now we can move all of these about. To move them, we're going to have to use a set position node. So let's search for the set position, plug that in right here. And the offset is going to be based off of some noise textures. So let's go ahead and press Shift A and search for a noise texture. Now remember, if we were to directly plug this noise texture in, it's going to move towards the top right and it's currently very, very small. Let's fix all of those by first pressing Shift A and searching for a math node and simply subtracting a value of 0.5 so that it comes back to the center. Now it's still shifting up and that's because this offset is supposed to take in a vector value and we should have used a vector map. But since I don't actually want these to move in all of the directions and I want them to only move up and down, I'm going to use this and then I'm going to search for a combine XYZ, plug that in right here with this value going into just the Z socket. So now you can see we have this coming in just like that. Now, of course, we don't want to add, we needed to subtract 0.5 and that should bring us back to the origin. Now we need to actually scale this up and we also need to reduce the size of the noise. So let's change this scale from five to maybe something like 0.4. And now you see we get a much smoother noise, but it's clearly not strong enough. To increase the strength, we'll just select this particular math node and press Shift D to duplicate, plug it in over here and change this from subtract to multiply. And now we can just multiply it by a large value and you get a nice looking curve. Now I think that the noise texture is still too large. So let's change this down to 0.2 and that looks great for what I want. Now I need this noise texture to keep moving towards the right and to make it move towards the right, we're going to have to use a position node and add in a value to the position. So let's search for a position node and just plug this into the vector. And now if we were to use a vector math node and plug it in between the position and the noise texture, you should be able to control the motion on the X axis just by moving this value. Now this looks great, but clearly we need to add in some more motion to it as well. Right now, the motion is absolutely non-existent. It's only moving towards the right. So it looks like a static image that's moving towards the right. We need this to be much more dynamic. So to make this more dynamic, we can superimpose another noise texture onto this. So let's go ahead and do that. For that, we'll press Shift A, search for a noise texture, or we can just select this one and press Shift D to duplicate it. Then let's press Shift A and search for a vector math node. And this time we're going to actually keep it at add itself and add in this noise texture. Now the problem with this noise texture is firstly, it's again moving towards the top right. So we need to search for another vector map and we need to make sure that we subtract out a value of 0.5 on all of the 
axes. So change this to subtract and put in a value of 0.5. The next thing is that this noise texture is very, very subtle compared to this that was multiplied by eight units. So if you see when we move this, you can barely tell the motion. So let's go ahead and increase the effect of this noise texture by using another vector math node. So we can select it, press shift D to duplicate and change this from subtract to scale. Now let's scale this up by quite the amount. And now when we were to move on any of the axes, you can see that we do get a nice dynamic motion. But again, this is a bit too much. So we're gonna do a few things. First, we'll scale this down to maybe just three. And also I feel like this should also be only on the Z axis but I think it's fine. It's really up to you. I'm actually going to keep it just like this. I like the motion in the other axes as well. So that's fine. Now we have to figure out how we're going to add in this particular value. We can not simply manually keyframe the value, which I think I'm going to do in this case, or you can add in an empty as we did in the previous video. But the issue that we're going to face is that no matter what value we add, we're not going to get the exact same shape again. So it will not be a looping texture. So to make this looping, the first thing that we're going to do is change this from 3D to 4D and then go ahead and play around with this vector over here. So we're going to do the same setup that we did in the previous video, which is searching for a few math nodes and changing them from add to sine and cosine. So let's select this, press shift D and change this to cosine. Then let's select both of these and press shift D to create another duplicate so that we can get repetition on the X axis as well as the Y axis. Then we're going to actually search for a combined X, Y, Z. So press shift A, search for a combined X, Y, Z and simply plug this output into the X and this one into the Y, plug this into the Z and then plug this last one into the W of the noise texture that we changed to 4D. So let's just move all of these a bit to the side, plug this in and take this and move this into the W. Again, if you want me to explain what this setup is doing and how we're converting these rectangular coordinates into a circular coordinate, which is actually causing the looping effect over some amount of linear space, do let me know and I'll try to create a video where we intuitively try to understand exactly what's happening in these nodes. And again, if you feel like setting this up is too much of work, you can always buy the project files on Patreon or subscribe to the monthly tiers where you'll get all of the blend files as well as the 4K renders and wallpaper based on which tier you're in. Now, to give the inputs to these sine and cosine waves, we're gonna go ahead and separate out the position into the X, Y, Z components. So let's press Shift A, search for a separate X, Y, Z node and simply plug the position into the separate X, Y, Z. Now, from the X, we can plug it into the sine and the cosine and from the Y, we can plug it into the next sine and cosine over here. Now, whatever texture we have is going to repeat every two pi units. So we need to ensure that we move this by two pi units. For that, let's press Shift A, search for a vector math node, plug that in right after this. And let's see what happens if we add in a value of two star pi on the X axis. And as you see, there was absolutely no difference, which means by moving this 6.28 units, we got the exact same shape back. So at zero, it looks like this. And at two pi, which is tau, we get the exact same shape. So we can just keyframe this value and it's going to work perfectly. So to actually create the animation, let's set all of our animation defaults by going to our output properties, changing the frame rate to 200% or a 4K animation. Frame rate is going to become 60 frames per second. End frame, we're gonna keep at 300 so that it's a five second long animation. Output folder can be wherever you want to store it. File format, we're gonna choose FFmpeg video with an encoding container changed to MPEG4 and an output quality of perceptually lossless. Then we'll press the back arrow to go to frame zero so that we don't get a repeating frame and we'll hover over this vector and we'll just tap I. So we've added in the first keyframe at a value of two pi. Then we'll go to frame 300 and we'll change this value back down to zero and again hover over it and tap I. And now we have keyframes which should allow this to move towards the right. But you see it's starting slowly, speeding up towards the middle and then slowing down again at the end. And that's because the default interpolation is always set to Bezier. To make this linear, we go down, press T and choose linear and now we'll get a smooth loop. It seems like it's moving very slow, but that's because the frame rate is not at the actual frame rate. So we have to go down to the playback and change from play every frame to frame dropping and that will give us a realistic idea of how fast this particular wave is moving. Remember, since you created this by yourself, it's completely customizable and you can choose to increase the height at which this is moving simply by playing around with this multiply node and things like that. So it's really up to you, but I think I'm gonna leave it at a multiplication value of 10 and that should be good enough. The next thing that we need to do is actually convert this into real geometry so that it can be rendered. For that, we're gonna shift the group output towards the side and press shift A and search for a curve to mesh node. Now this curve to mesh node requires a profile curve for which we're gonna have to use a curve circle. However, you could use whatever you want. 
I'm going to reduce the resolution to something like 10 because we don't need too much of a high resolution and the radius I'm going to keep at 0.001 initially. Let's plug the curve into the profile curve and just switch off overlays so that we see what we have. Now that might be a bit too small so let's increase the radius to maybe 0.005 and I think that is thick enough. I might play around with that just before rendering but this seems to be the base idea. The next thing that we need to do is actually give it a material so let's press shift a search for a set material and plug that in right here so we'll select the default material because we're not using that for anything else however for this particular material i want it to actually fade from this to that into complete transparency so we need to actually know which particular curve it is you could do this by setting up a gradient texture but the problem with the gradient texture is that you'd have to play around with the mapping node to make sure that the gradient starts over here and ends over here and it's very hard to tell so. So instead of that, what we can do is actually press Shift A and search for a store named attribute node. We can plug that in right over here and instead of storing a value for every point, we'll change this from point to spline so that we store one particular value for each of these splines. Now remember, each spline has its own index. So what we do is change this from float to integer and then we search for a curve info node. Now the curve info comes with a curve index which gives us a value from the first curve to the last curve. So let's plug that in right over here. And now the first curve will get an index of one, then the next one will get an index of two, three, four, and so on till the last curve, which should have an index of 40. So let's just call this as curve index. So we'll call it CI and we'll use this particular value in our shader editor. Now to actually see the changes that we make to the material, we'll switch our viewport shading to rendered and we'll go ahead and make changes to our render properties. The changes are simply going to be switching on bloom as well as screen space reflections, going down to color management and changing this from filmic to agx then in the material properties we'll change the blend mode from opaque to alpha blend shadow mode we can also switch to none and we can just remove this default light for now then we'll switch our geometry node editor to the shader editor and play around with this particular material we don't need the principled psdf so we'll tap x to delete it now we'll search for two nodes one is the transparent psdf and the other is the emission node now we're going to mix these two together so let's press shift a and search for a mixed shader and plug this into the first socket and this into the second socket and plug the shader into the surface so right now we're getting a mix between the emission as well as the transparent but we want it such that these are fully emissive and these are fully transparent so to do that we press shift a and search for an attribute node and then we can simply plug this factor into the factor but we need to make a few changes the first thing is we need to actually tell which attribute we want and that was the curve index or ci the next thing is we need to remap it to go from zero to one so let's search for a map range node and because remember the indices are going from a value value of 1 to a value of 40 but we want the output to go from 0 to 1. So now you see we get a smooth gradient that goes from completely bright over here to completely transparent on this side over here. That is exactly what we wanted so that works great. Next we can just increase the emission strength and now play around with the colors. For the colors let's go ahead and just select our camera and press alt g to clear its location alt r to clear its rotation followed by rx 90 to rotate it on the x-axis by 90 degrees. Then we can press 0 to go into our camera view and press g followed by y to just bring it back so that it's centralized again you can centralize the camera once again but it's really up to you once you're happy with the position you can go to viewport display and just increase pass part 2 all the way to 1 so that you don't see anything outside the camera view then once the camera is set up with this object selected you can go ahead and press shift a and search for a gradient texture and do the same thing that we did in the previous video let's press ctrl t to get the texture coordinate and mapping node and switch over to the window coordinates we can actually delete the mapping node and now this particular gradient if you just plug it into the emission you'll see that it starts from black to white. However, you can add in a color ramp so that you can put in whatever colors you want. Let's change this from linear to ease and just add in another stop in the center. And this time I'm maybe going to go with a bluish color on this side, a reddish color on this side. And you could again have whatever you want in the middle. So in this case, it's becoming some sort of a white color. You could have a greenish color. It's really up to you and what you think is best for your scene. However, the next thing that we have to do is going to our world settings and change the background all the way to black, then increase this so that we get a lot more bloom. And again, in the bloom settings, I'm actually going to go ahead and just increase the intensity all the way to one as well as the radius so that the entire background is also lit up. It might not look too great over here. Maybe we'll just reduce the strength down to 15, but it'll look a lot better when we actually render it out in 4K. Remember, the next step is going to be compositing to make it look a lot more misty. For that, we're gonna switch over from our shader editor to the compositor, and we're gonna switch on the real-time compositor through our camera lens so that we can see the changes that we make. Let's go ahead and select use nodes and again, centralize the nodes. If you can't see them, 
press period on your numpad to centralize them. Then we'll just bring this to the side. And the first thing that we need to do is just add in a little bit more glow towards the actual wave. For that, we press shift A and search for a glare node, plug that in. And we're gonna change this from streaks to actually fog. And although right now it looks way too bright, when you actually render out a single image, you'll see that it's slightly different from what you saw. So again, I feel like in this particular situation, it still is too bright. So I might play around with the bloom settings a little bit. But again, you have to make sure that you get this right when you create your own animation. But the next thing that I'm going to do is what's going to give it the real misty look. And that is actually adding in another filter. So you can press shift A, go into filter and choose this Kuwahara. This is actually something like a paint filter and it makes everything look like a painting. So that is what's going to actually make these look a lot more foggy and make it look like it was a lot more work. I'm going to actually change this from classic to anisotropic and I'm going to increase the uniformity all the way to 50, reduce the sharpness and increase the eccentricity. Those are the settings that I found work best. And remember, the larger the size, the longer it's going to take to render. Each frame ended up taking 10 to 15 minutes in my initial test run. So I kept the size at 20 and that's when I hit the render. But remember, since you're actually compositing onto the image, it depends on the pixels. So you see when you're actually zoomed in, the effect looks completely different as compared to when you're zoomed out. So similarly, right now it looks like one thing, but when you actually press the render button and you render out an image, the final image is going to be completely different compared to what you render, or at least what you see when you initially see it in the real time compositor. As you can see, the render initially took six seconds just to create this animation, but the actual compositing is still initializing after which it's going to go through the entire overlay so it'll take a while all right so it took 18 minutes to finally finish rendering or at least the compositing and you can clearly see that this is absolutely not what it looked like in the real-time compositor over here so you have to ensure that you actually render it out once or twice to make sure that you have the perfect look that you're going for you might have to play around with the size uniformity and things like that to get exactly what you want for my final render i actually used an eccentricity value of two and a sharp of 0.4. For the time being, I'm going to disable the compositor, but when you're happy with what you get, you can go ahead and press render animation. I hope this was a fun tutorial and you learned something from it. I know the techniques were very similar to what we did in the previous video. However, you can see that a similar technique can yield completely different results. So there's definitely a lot of creativity that you can also implement to create your own animations and completely unique loops by using the techniques that you learn in these videos. I will be posting videos every single day. So until the next video comes out tomorrow, don't forget to check out other videos on my channel. And as always, keep creating and stay creative.